Okay. Um, so well, now we are jumping from chapter three to chapter ten uh, because then it makes easier the computations uh, when we go to hierarchical models in chapter five and so on. Um, and then in chapter ten, the most important things are these how many simulation draws are needed and this year I've also added then the slide and also for the chapter notes um, information about how many digits to show in your reports and overall also if you uh, write scientific papers or present any um, your analysis results also for your customers how many digits would be good to solve. Um, there's overall bit of these uh, things about these integration, numerical integration methods, both deterministic and uh, stochastic. But then a bit more about important sampling. We are not using that often important sampling anymore in generic computation. Uh, but it's used as a part of this fast, important sampling leave one out computation you use later. And in order to understand that easier, we use important sampling also in this bioassau example. So you can see the, um, it in first in familiar context and then uh, also in the leave one out context. Um, in previous year, someone was, some student was confused since there was only P theta. That is this chapter only about priors. No, it is just generic any distribution. And then most often it would be the posterior distribution. But it's just saving a bit of ink um, to use now the just P theta. There's Unnormalized distribution denoted by Q. Uh, and now we assume that most of the time these unnormalized distributions are such that they have finite integral. But it's just that this finite integral is not necessarily one. And then we would use this proportional to, uh, that they are proportional to this P we are interested actually in. And I've already talked uh, previous times that luckily we often don't need to know that normalization term and uh, about that also this time and then next week when talking about Markov chain Monte Carlo. Again, another example why we don't need that. There's also now distribution G, which is then used in some of these uh, algorithms discussed today as part of the proposal distribution. Also, this chapter uh, briefly mentions about computational issues, but I, in this lecture I talk a bit more um, that why we need to do sometimes certain tricks and why we need to be aware limitations of computers. We do most of our computations using floating points, so there's a finite number of bits used to present numbers, which means that there's only then finite um, possible values we can present. Um, there are sometimes these extended uh, systems, but they are not commonly used when um, we need also have short time speed. Um, in stand, we mostly use uh, or Stan is only using 64-bit floating pre presentations. Those familiar with deep learning may know that, in case of deep learning, uh, also 32-bit, 16-bit, and even sometimes 8-bit floating point presentations are used. Well, in the in case of this 64-bit floating point presentation, the, we have um, 
possibility of underflow. The closest value to zero is shown here, there. It is very small, but it is also that when we are working with these unnormalized densities, we actually often see very small or very large values getting underflows or overflows. For example, if we think that we would have the true data generating mechanism would be normal distribution with zero mean standard deviation one, we generate 600 observations from the, that normal distribution. And then we would calculate what is the, uh, the probability density assuming normal model. We would evaluate the density for each observation uh, using normal density. So in this case, it's R code D norm. And we get 600 different density values. We assume that these observations are independent from normal distribution. So based on uh, probability calculus, we can multiply them. But now this joint density is too small, too close to zero, that it's rounded to zero. And we don't want this to happen. In the next slide, I saw what happens if we do it in log densities. But then, uh, before that, the other example where they specifically, they, um, that now also the, this accuracy varies in the range. So in case of probabilities, we are interested often also values close to one. And you can see that there the accuracy is more coarse. Um, this difference is often called epsilon, uh, what is the kind of the smallest difference to one. If we think about the example Laplace and ratio of curl and um, boy babies, and we use beta distribution, as you've learned in an exercise, and try to find out what is the cumulative density. So what is the probability that the ratio is smaller than half? We get a rounding error to one. Um, in some cases, it might be fine. We just say that, OK, it's so close to one, uh, and it doesn't matter in a way that we would know it more accurately. But sometimes we have a need to compute also this more accurately. And one way is that we remember that, oh, there's more accuracy near zero. So instead of computing the usual cumulative density, let's compute that remaining tail part. So saying lower tail equals false, we are computing then the upper tail mass. And now we have enough accuracy. Um, so in general, we use all the time log densities when doing Bayesian computations to avoid these over and under flows. The example from previously, so there was the 600 uh, normally distributed and joint density for them we can now ask that instead return the log density value. Inside these functions, these are anyway usually computed in log density and exponentiated just before giving the answer um, so that the, the kind of the, we have the possibility to get this log density uh, without trying to get a log of zero. Now you can go and check that what is the uh, smallest possible value we can present in uh, floating point representation. And then you could figure out that how many normally distributed observations we could handle. And it's much, much more than 600. So that's why work in log densities. And when using log densities, there are certain cases where we need to compute also 
density, so we need to exponentiate, but we want to do that as late as possible. Here's an example that if we know that um, A is much larger than B, we want to avoid exponentiating A, and we can use this kind of identity uh, that instead of exponentiating both, we exponentiate only the difference. And it's often the case that A and B would be both very large, and then the difference would be much smaller. So here's example that exponentiating 800, uh, it's infinite, and then if then it doesn't help that we take a logarithm of infinite. But then if we change the order of calculation, we can stay inside the uh, range of floating point numbers. Uh, next week, in your exercise, you will implement Metropolis algorithm. And there, you need to compute logarithm of ratio of densities. But instead of computing the ratio of densities, you can just compute the difference of the logarithms. And that's the logarithm of ratio of densities. Okay. Um, overall, the Bayesian computation, it's all about computing expectations. Um, we form here, the blue one is now the posterior distribution, and then we want to know uh, expectation of some function. It might be that we are just, uh, expectation could be simply the mean. Uh, it could be also these the different intervals, interval endpoints can be derived also through, through the expectations. Probabilities that uh, the temperature in some certain place is increasing and so on. And this posture distribution, we can write it, there's the base um, rule there. So we have the green one is, we have the likelihood and prior term, and then we have the normalization term. And we can easily, so the, there are of course also cases where we are using, for example, simulation models where it's not easy to evaluate these likelihood terms. But in this course, we are only looking at that kind of models where we can easily evaluate the likelihood term and prior term for any theta. We just need to decide for which theta values we evaluate it. The integral red one is difficult because for that, we kind of need to evaluate it everywhere or we need to have analytic solution for that. But then the lucky thing is that we can use these unnormalized posterior. Uh, and sometimes, yes, there is actually kind of surf normalization. I did last week uh, discuss uh, grid evaluation with surf normalization. So if you evaluate uh, the density, the, un uh, the unnormalized posterior density in the grid, and then you can just sum these densities and divide by the sum, and then you have probability for each grid cell. And see, here you can see then self-normalization of the below hand of the, the, the uh, under the line, uh, summing these normalized densities there. Or in Monte Carlo methods, we have some way which does not require knowing this normalization term, and we get just these posterior draws, uh, and we can just use this empirical mean. Um, 
In chapters one to five, it was conjugate priors, analytic solutions. Uh, in chapter five, there's also one uh, uh, one dimensional uh, integral with no analytic solution, but mostly conjugate priors. We did have this grid integration in chapter three and in your exercise, chapter 10 mentions some other options. Chapter 10 has also this uh, independent Monte Carlo rejection and importance sampling. And then next week, uh, we talk about Markov chain Monte Carlo, distributional approximations. You have now, um, like the importance sampling is closed there, starting from distributional approximation, but more about these are in chapter four, which we discuss in the end of the course, and then chapter 13, which we don't discuss in this course, but you can read if you are interested in. Again, I did uh, mention this last week, so this is just reminding. Um, we evaluate the function in grid, and then now in unidimensional each cell is just this kind of bar, and then uh, the integral is just weighted uh, weights given these each bar and the weight could be then, for example, the uh, probability of that um, given the normalized probability. Uh, this, there are some sp specific cases where it is reasonable to look also more advanced uh, quadrature methods in low dimensions. Even just like the trapezoid, you can see now that um, if the blue line is our approximation and going piecewise constant, there's bigger difference to true function than if we have trapezoid or just uh, interpolating linearly, or we could have quadratic um, interpolations. This would give better accuracy with the same number of function evaluations. Uh, we don't discuss those in this course, but I just want to remind you that in, in a way that, um, that the, kind of the, the Markov chain Monte Carlo methods we, where we go are very generic, but it's, there are reasons why sometimes people use these deterministic methods as they can have better accuracy with less uh, function evaluations, but then they are also of limited then in low dimensions or very specific um, kind of models and integrals. And we can get in high dimensions with nested quadrature methods or product rules and so on. But it's difficult to go in very high dimensions or in moderate dimensions as I discuss with the grid integration later. Um, Monte Carlo was used before computers. Um, Buffon uh, had an example. It's not completely clear whether he did actually the simulation or, or was it just a kind of the thought experiment and uh, and then the mathematical derivation that yes, that would work. You can see in, in here in the floor, there are these wooden tiles forming uh, lines. And if we think about just the lines in this direction, and if we would drop a needle and then count how that, whether it, it crossed a um, line and drop again, sometimes it drops so that it's not crossing the line. If we know the length of the needle and the width of these lines, just computing then the ratio, how often the needle doesn't cross the line and how often it crosses, we can derive pi. Um, 
it's interesting. Darwin and Galton also made simulations for um, the evolution. Pearson uh, did analyze roulette wheels. He was not interested in himself testing testing this, but based on his, um, he showed that how many roulette wheel uh, kind of the retrials is needed that you could learn this multinomial distribution, how, what is the probability for each number. And someone did use that information. They went to casino, uh, hired people to just um, put in a notebook every number from the roulette wheel. And after a few days, they could see that, okay, now the probability that we know that this is more likely is big enough that we can start uh, betting money, and they did win. Uh, casino noticed that, they moved the tables, and just moving the tables changed a little bit the tilt, and it didn't work anymore. And after that, the roulette wheels were installed with small, these um, angled pieces and screw, so every morning, uh, they could just twist screws a little bit, so every day it was tilted slightly in a different orientation, so you couldn't anymore in one day collect enough information to beat roulette. I did mention last week that William Gossett used uh, pieces of paper and draw from hat, small uh, number of observations to study how the mean of small uh, observations as wider tails than Gaussian. The Monte Carlo method was term, term was proposed by Metropolis von Neumann or Ulam. It's not um, clear who actually then did it, that they were working together in atomic bomb project um, where they had to, they were simulating this physical problem uh, how when atom uh, splits and you get neutrons which split other atoms and they were trying to figure out uh, what is the needed concentration uh, of this radioactive material that you, the chain reaction would be uh, contained um, and then they did this by simulation. At that time they had mechanical computers and simulations were then um, partially made by really mechanical computers where someone uh, turned a crank to um, make the computations to happen. They did also went to Las Vegas uh, play at Casino and then uh, it's likely that, that that connection made them to think about this Monte Carlo method. Um, this was for a long time it was only in physics because of the atom bombs physicists got computational power to continue uh, doing these Monte Carlo uh, simulations um, there were also at least one Bayesian in the beginning of 1970s writing a great paper um, on extensions of this Metropolis algorithm, but it was just that most of the statisticians didn't have access to computers. So only in 1990s they started to have personal computers at their desktop and they could do it without asking anyone what they can do with that. And then there was this Bugs project which started 1989 implementing the first probabilistic programming software, which then started uh, very kind of the fast increase of usage of Monte Carlo methods in Bayesian statistics. And it started also this that the Bayesian methods finally started to have advantage over frequentist methods because uh, the computational problem, how we can 
compute expectations for more complex models uh, did finally have this kind of general solution. Uh, and just having a fast enough computer and waiting enough time could go all the time more complex models without need to think about um, for each model change how to compute. Um, so in grid integration, we decided deterministically where we evaluate the function. Um, and it's good when we have some information where we put them. Uh, and Monte Carlo method, it's then useful when we don't know so well where to put, even in this um, in chapter 10, examples are still that kind of Monte Carlo methods that they need some guess where the target distribution is, but they are such that they also, in some cases, work better in higher dimensions. So the Monte Carlo can be sometimes also called simulation methods. Um, Andrew Gelman likes uh, to talk about the simulation methods, and it's also called stochastic um, integration method. Um, you already did use simulation approach also in a way that you did, did have the deterministic grid, but then you could also um, simulate from other analytically uh, formed posture distributions, or you could simulate also from grid, as it was then easy to compute some derived quantities. And beforehand, we, there was no that, okay, how many simulations you need? But now we have here the answer for that. Um, if these draws are independent, we, ha we can think about what is the uncertainty in those empirical averages we compute in the same way as we have, we are using uh, these probabilistic models for any observations. So in the same way as we would, for the speed of light experiment, we would like to know what is the mean and uncertainty about the mean, um, we can then look at what is the mean from finite sample, which would be our estimate for the integral, but also what is the uncertainty related to that mean? Do we know the value of the integral now accurately enough? This week I'll just talk about what if these are independent and then later we come to Markov chain Monte Carlo, which produces in, um, dependent draws, and then we need to take into account also this time dependency, uh, but we come back later to that. So this would be the, the empirical average given simulations, estimating that uh, expectations. Um, and it's also that even if theta would be something that it's not normally distributed. As long as the theta comes from a distribution which has finite variance, if we get a big enough sample size, then we know that the uncertainty or the expectation approaches normal distribution anyway. We'll come, we'll come back to this central limit theorem, asymptotic normality, back in chapter four in the end of the uh, course. Um, this requires now that, yes, it, is, it has to be that theta has um, finite variance, that we get this um, Normally, normality or, or the asymptotic normality assumption, 
Um, when I talk about MCMC and convergence diagnostics for that, I will talk a little bit about also what we do then if uh, the posterior distribution is such that it does not have finite variance, what kind of quantities we can still estimate and what kind of for what kind of quantities we can still get these um, Monte Carlo uncertainty estimates. The good thing about this is the, the also here is that this variance, the uncertainty is independent uh, of dimensionality of theta. Uh, so that as long as we are able to get even from very high dimensional distribution independent draws, uh, this convergence rate for each marginal theta um, is the same. You can remember from the last week then that we have in this normal model. Uh, so we have the uncertainty overall, what is the value of theta, which we can have now here, it's the sigma theta squared is the variance for that. And then we have the uncertainty, what is the actual, the mean value of theta. And then that goes smaller when we get more and more draws. But that also means that we don't need to get that uncertainty about the mean value super accurate if the posterior is wide anyway. I have some illustrations of this soon. But just to, like the numerically, we know that now the kind of the the Monte Carlo error is inflating our uncertainty by this one plus one per L. And even just with 100 simulation draws, this standard deviation uncertainty is re increasing only uh, half percentage. So for the expectations, usually 100 is enough independent draws. So MC, more, we usually need more MCMC MC draws, and we usually need more draws for other quantities than mean. Uh, we come back to chapter four, which shows also other counter examples than just the, uh, like the infinite variance case. There are other cases where um, this asymptotic normality doesn't hold. This is Kilpis Yarvi summer temperature. So average temperature at different years or over June, July, and August. And Kilpis Yarvi is in very northern part of Finland. Um, and it starts from 1950 something and the latest was something like 2016 maybe, if I remember correctly. Um, and we are interested in now that is the temperature, average summer temperature in Kilpis Järvi increasing? We can fit linear model. So we have two parameters, slope and intercept. And we are interested in whether the slope is positive. Here's the posture fit with 90% its interval. So uh, if we would draw posture draws and with each posture draw we would draw a line, 90% of those lines would be inside of these dashed lines. So just by eye now it seems that it's likely that it's positive. This is the posterior of temperature change uh, decrease of Celsius per year. And I instead then now saw it as a decrease of Celsius per century so that it's an it's, um, easier scale um, for, again, how many digits to solve. And we can see that, yes, uh, there's some uncertainty, small probability that it would be below zero. Um, before going to looking at the, that, uh, that part, 
let's just look at the posterior mean. Um, the previous calculation showed that 100 could be sufficient. Here also, we can see that overall we are saying that, okay, the um, temperature change could be something between 0 and 4 degrees. We don't need then in that case more accurate estimate for the mean than what we now get. Uh, you can see now that the this sigma theta and the Monte Carlo standard error, and then when we combine them, so we need we can combine them in variance scale, and then take the square root to get total deviation, and we can see that there's not much difference um, in the uncertainty. We could get more uh, draws to get more accurate, but for example here it, it's um, not needed for, for the mean. However, the reason why we often need more than 100 is that in addition of mean, we are interested here, for example, the what is the range uh, and what is the probability that it's, uh, the temperature is larger than zero. And now, I'm showing now in the upper plot it's 100 draws and a lower plot it's 1,000 draws. But then what if we are interested in 5 percentage quantile? You can see now that with the same number of draws we have more uncertainty in tail quantities. And further away in tail we go, so 1 percentage quantile it's even more uncertain. So that's why we often need more draws because we are also interested in these poster intervals and then we would need to uh, have certain accuracy for reporting the interval endpoints with certain number of digits. So how many do we need then when looking at these tail quantiles or if looking at the posterior probabilities, uh, for example, the temperature is larger than zero. Um, computing the probability that theta belongs to certain region, for example, that uh, the temperature would be larger than zero, we can have an indicator function that it's um, one when theta belongs, to, uh, is inside that region, for example, one when temperature is above zero, and then the indicator function is zero when we are not in that region. And we can recognize that we have this binary process, zeros and ones, and then we can recognize that then this indicator function is binomially distributed with given this certain probability, and we know for the binomially distributed model how to compute variance and standard deviation, or we could use also beta distribution to compute quantiles. But from here we see now that this 100 draws, even for median, uh, the, at the central value, probability of half, we get much more uncertainty uh, whether the probability is 50 percent it's or um, maybe something from 40 to 60 percent it's. So for probabilities we need more draws. We need 2500 draws for one percentage unit accuracy and it gets worse when we go to small probabilities. In the same way as we could see that what's the uncertainty for quantiles, also small probabilities, we need a larger number of draws. You can think of it, it in that way that when we have the binomially distributed um, thing, 
in order to estimate the probability well, we need observations from both categories. So when we have a very small probability, we need simulation draws also from that small probability event, and of course we need a lot of simulation draws to get at least certain number from that small probability event. Continuing with this Kilpisjärvi summer temperature example, if we have just 100 draws, quite often we would have zero draws um, for slope being less than zero. And here would be the, how the beta distribution would tell what is our uncertainty. We can see that the probability is likely to be less than uh, 0.05. Um, but then with just 100 draws, we might sometimes also get one draw, and we can see there's a clearly difference in the probability for the smallest probabilities, still quite a lot of uncertainty. We might sometimes get two draws, and for this probability, 100 draws is not good. We would get different results in different simulation rounds. This is 1,000, much better. Uh, on expectation, we get about eight draws below zero. 4,000, which is the usual what Stan would give, even if they are not always independent draws. There would be 34 draws. And we get this uncertainty smaller. Now we can see also now that it's likely that based on this already we have enough information that um, just the, this Kilpisjärvi data from 50s to this um, decade, it's not yet uh, enough to completely rule out that it's not increasing but it's very small probability that it would not be increasing. Um, we can then kind of the come to that also that why it is important to know how many simulation draws, it's related to also when you are reporting something, how many digits you would show in reports. If we have too many digits, it makes reading the results slower, especially if you are reporting many results, but it also gives false impression of the accuracy. If you report certain digits, the reader assumes that you know these are meaningful. So you should show only what is meaningful. The first rule is that don't show digits which are just random noise. You have been now told how to compute Monte Carlo standard error it means in a way that if you would repeat the simulation, certain digits would just randomly change in new simulation, but you can use the Monte Carlo standard error right after w first simulation to check which digits are unlikely to change anymore, and those you can report. Sometimes you can continue the simulation so much that you would actually, from this, for the specific model, you could report some of the quantities with very, very many digits, but also so meaningful digits given the posture uncertainty. It was mentioned that for the uh, mean of the posture, or 100 simulation draws would be enough because additional accuracy, more digits for the mean, is not meaningful if the posture interval is wide. So backing back to this temperature increase, if we think about the mean and 90% center, uh, 90 central posture interval, we don't want to report this. Way many two digits. They are not meaningful. They are not helping. It's slower to read um, and so on. This is good, um, 
here, even if we would have so many simulations that we would, in theory, would be able to report accurately more digits for the mean, compared to the width of the 90% its interval, it is enough to have these two significant digits. It might be that sometimes we would even report that two and one and three. Uh, if we go to a longer interval, I also told that when looking at the posture that um, with high probability, the temperature increase is between zero and four. So we could sometimes even drop the extra um, digit here. But this depends now on the context. Uh, the probability that the temperature inc increase is positive? Nope. Here it just happens by chance also that it's actually this round number, so there are a lot of zeros. It could be also sometimes that there's non-zeros in the end. Um, we could sometimes report this as 1.00, which in this case, instead of reporting it exactly as 1, reporting it as 1.00 means that it's not yet 1, but it's larger than 0 0.99. Um, I think that it, it's, it can be risky to report it like this because it assumes that the reader understands then kind of the how to read number of significant digits. Um, if you look at the kind of the, what the error is, I think that here the sensible thing it would be that report that probability is very likely larger than 0 0.99. That would say that there's still some room for it not being exactly one. Or we could sample more justify reporting three digits, which in this case actually requires quite much bigger uh, simulation. In reporting three digits, there's also then the case that, is it meaningful for this specific case? We know that it's just Kilpisjärvi, uh, summer temperature data. Would it be more sensible that instead of reporting this probability closer to one, we would get more data from other places in Earth and then figure out if we get also more, un more certainty that temperature is increasing. So for probabilities close to zero and one, consider also the application information and whether the model assumptions just defer a certain accuracy. It is also possible here that it's not actually linear. It might be actually accelerating and so on. So it's likely that here it is enough to say that based on just the Kilpisjärv data, temperature is increasing with probability more than 0 0.99. And let's get more data to have better uh, conclusions. Um, and a reminder also now that this was for independent Monte Carlo draws. So we need less draws when we are using deterministic methods and they have other ways than to compute these uh, errors. Um, we can sometimes do part of the integration analytically to improve uh, accuracy and then there are different variance reduction methods such as control variates, which are not discussed in this course, but um, possible. I did mention also already this, that number of independent rows doesn't depend on the number of dimensions, but it may be difficult to obtain independent rows in high dimensional case. Okay, uh, let's have break, 10 minutes. <laughs>